So a DRAM stands for Dynamic Random Access Memory, and this is also a read-write, and this is the, what we call the RAM in your computers. Okay? And the reason that it's so dense is because you create it with a capacitor, Okay? So you store the information in a capacitor, and then you access the information with a single transistor. Okay? So then what you do is you come along here, and you put like a transistor right here, and then you can access it here with a line, and you can access it here with a line. So right here is where you read the contents of what's on there, and we'll put this at ground just for a, as an example. So if you charge this baby up, to a hold of one, so it said it's power supply. Well, what happened is if you looked at it through this transistor, you would see a one, and it's sort of one. Or you could discharge it to a zero, and you'd look at it with this line right there, you'd see a zero. How many transistors does this take? One T, one transistor? Correct. This is referred to, I didn't even write it, as a one T cell. Okay. Now, since you can do it with one transistor, it's very small. And you go, whoa, dude, you got a capacitor in there now. There are companies, such as like Micron and all these other manufacturers of DRAM, they have figured out very clever ways to make capacitors. Okay. And they make them just these really cool looking. When you think of a capacitor, you probably think of this traditional parallel plate business, right? You see this little thing right here? This is what we always draw. And you have like a dielectric between them, and then you have two metal plates that sit out there. Isn't that what you think of when you think of a capacitor? What they do on an integrated circuit is they make like a, I don't even know how to describe it. What would you call it? A bowl? It's almost like a bowl, okay? So it's like this. <clears throat> and then what they do is they, they dig this trench, and then they coat it with some conductive material, and then they put some insulating material in there, and then they put another conductive piece of or material, and they form two plates that are next to each other. I mean, it's crazy. You see, the, the pictures of the, of the cross-sections of these chips are just crazy. They're just like, like massive bowls, and it's like those are the capacitors, okay? So anyway, that's dynamic random access memory. Now you go, what the D for? Why do you think you call it dynamic? It's because the capacitors are not ideal, and so they leak. So what that means is that if you store one on the capacitor and you go away for like a minute and come back, it'll be gone. So what you have to do is you constantly have to refresh the information. So your DRAM, this, the DRAM on your computer, it's holding information. It's holding Windows 10. But it is constantly overriding the values, refreshing the ones and zeros that are on there. Okay? So it's constantly in motion. And SRAM doesn't have to do that. You write it once, and it holds the information using the power. This one, you have to constantly refresh it. Okay? So if you put an oscilloscope on a DRAM, it's banging. All right, all right. So let's look at some cool pictures that I drew. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you still have the concept of a word line, but now the word line is turning on an access transistor. And now, what's unique about this, which is kind of cool, is the, we call it a digit line. Okay? And I don't know why it changed to digit line instead of bit line, but just DRAM, the terminology is digit line. Okay? And so you have this digit line that runs like that. And if you were going to create an array, it looks very similar. Okay? It looks very similar. You just have these new types of cells, and you just put information in there and read from it. Okay? How's that feel? Okay, there are a couple weirdnesses to DRAM that are interesting to know, primarily just for common knowledge as an engineer. Here's the, here's the situation. You have a capacitor, okay? And it's connected to ground. And let's say for a second that you charged it up to VCC. Okay, so let's say that your power supply was, let's even use a number, 3.4 volts. And you said, I'm going to store one, so you charge this puppy up to plus 3.4 volts. So it's holding a one. Okay, it's holding a one. And then you come along and you go, okay, well now what I'd like to do is I'd like to come along here and I'd like to turn on that baby by asserting the word line. And then I would like to do a little bit of looking at what it is, okay? 
That guy right there with some ears, skinny neck, maybe some feet. I don't know. So you sit here and you go, okay, what's the problem here? Here's the issue. In a digital system, ones are almost always the highest voltage in the system. Okay? Zeros are the lowest voltage. So zeros are typically ground, and a one is typically your power supply. So in this situation, it's a 3.4. How do you turn on a transistor? Okay? If you take a little sidebar over here, and you drew the transistor normally the way that we look at it, we have gate on the left, and then the drain and the source over here. How do you turn that thing on? You put a voltage on the gate. But remember that it wasn't just a voltage. It was a voltage high enough to turn it on. And what high enough meant was it had to overcome a threshold voltage. Okay? And the threshold voltage, we always say it's 0.7 or 0.5. These are the type of things that you see. Well, if you put this relative to ground, it, it is indeed truly 0.7 volts would turn that on. Okay, So it's like, okay, that's great. What is the issue, though, when you come to this thing? Well, if this, we'll call this the source, we'll call this the source, and this is still the gate, and this is the gate, <clears throat> what's the problem? In this example, assume, pretend that it's already at 3.4 volt. If the threshold voltage, you have to overcome it, let's say it was 0 0.7 volts, so the, the threshold voltage, over here, it was relative, you connected the source to ground, to zero. So the gate had to be at indeed 0.7 volts to turn it on. Over here, the source is not at ground though, is it? When you have this charge to a one, it's actually at 3.4 volts. So what would the gate have to be at? Yeah, it'd have to be at at least 0.7 higher than 3.4. You'd need to do 4.1 volts. Okay. Now, 4.1 volts. Has anybody got a battery that's doing 4.1? Anybody got a regulator that does 4.1? No one likes 4.1. We like 3.4, 3.3, 5 volts maybe. So the problem here is that we use 3.4 for the, the common power supply throughout the chip. That's how we've done it for all time. And all of a sudden, you come into a situation where when this thing holds a 1, we have to produce a voltage that's higher than the power supply in order to access this transistor. So this sucks. This is one of the first things that, the first concepts of a DRAM, is that on each of these word lines, you have what is called a charge pump. Okay? And a charge pump is something where you use a capacitor, and you inject charge into it, <clears throat> and you build up a voltage on that capacitor that is higher than the power supply. So you don't just take the power supply and hook it to the capacitor and charge it at 3.4. What you do is you charge it up over time in order to get it up to a high voltage so you can access the cell. This also means it doesn't, when you access these, it doesn't happen instantaneously. You have to do boom, 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 boom. You have to do multiple steps. Let me show you a charge pump, just a circuit of the most common charge pump, just so you can see it. And here's what happens. What you do is you, you use diodes and capacitors, and you use a chain of them. And then what you do is you turn on and off complementary using these buffers. And what you do is you try to run current through this thing. This, basically, these inverters, it's going to go low, high. Then it's going to switch back and forth. So it's going to go low, high, high, low, low, high, high, low, low, high, high, low. And what you can see is that during the low, high state, you charge up this capacitor, so the current comes into that capacitor. But the diode prevents that current from going back through it, since current only flows one way in a diode. So then when you switch the polarities, that charge that was on there, you push it this way over through another diode into here. And then what you do is you do a complementary switch that again, and what will happen is that the current can't flow back through this diode, so it'll go through another diode, and you build this big chain. And the more of these little stages that you have, the higher voltage you can get. The problem is that it takes multiple clock cycles. Now, this is beyond anything we want to look at in logic design. No, I'm joking. We just looked at it. Right? It's not that hard. Okay? It's just the current goes one way. But it, the whole concept here is that, okay, number one, it's, you have to be at least a threshold above that 3.4, and you usually don't have something that high in your circuit. Okay? So you need a charge pump, 
And then you, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do charge pump, but the basic concept is you use diodes and capacitors and piecemeal them, have a cascade of them, okay? All right, how's that feel? Okay, now here is this interesting situation. <clears throat> you are storing information in a capacitor, okay? And what happens is that it's, it's got a capacitance, the capacitance of the storage cell or whatever the hell it is, okay? Well, then you come along <clears throat> and what happens is that you put charge on there, but then when you read it out, you, you always think about things as, well, I'm reading a one or a zero, so you assume that it's being driven back into you with full drive strength. Okay? It's just like an inverter or something blasting a one or a zero at you. But in this situation, it's not. All it does is it shares with you its charge. It doesn't have drive strength, it's just holding charge, and then as soon as you ask for it, it goes bleh. Okay? So you go, well, okay, well, what happened? How do I take the bleh of coulombs and convert that into a voltage. Well, if you think about the circuit that is involved here, you have your access transistor, which you would assume is turned on. Okay, so this is going to be, you know, 4.1 volts. And then you have this puppy right here. Okay, so you got this baby right here, and this is the digit line. Okay, well, this is a big strip of copper, and at the end of it is a receiver. So this actually has capacitance also. And so what you have is this puppy right here has a capacitance, which we call the digit line capacitance. It turns out that, let's say that this digit line is sitting at a zero, and this capacitor is storing like a 3.4 volts. As soon as you open it up, the voltage that you will actually observe right here, so it's like, I want to observe, man. The voltage that you see depends on the values of those capacitors, and what happens is it's a charge sharing problem. So you to basically say, okay, when this is open, you are going to have a voltage and a capacitance, and that is going to result in some amount of charge, some amount of Q. Then you, over here, you're going to have basically a discharge capacitor. When you close this, this charge, this Q, is going to dissipate across these things, and what will happen is a voltage will develop. So the question is then, what is that voltage? Okay, you want to do an example? All right, let's do an example. Okay, here's the whole concept. It's conservation of charge. Okay, however much charge you have, Q, the end. Okay, except that in the beginning, in the beginning, if you're going, well, let's, let's put some numbers on this little thingamajig. So we need to have the storage capacitor. What's the example we're going to use? It's going to be blah, blah, blah. Let's say that it is 10 picofarads, okay? And then let's say that the CDL is going to be 150 picofarads, okay? So those are values. Those are actually normal values that you might see in a DRAM, okay? And then what we're going to do is we are going to say that a 1 VCC is going to be 3.3 volts, okay? So this is going to initially, plus or minus V, so this is going to be V, the storage, and this is initially is going to be 3.3 volts, and this puppy's open, okay? So you sit there and you go, okay, charge it up to 3.3 volts across a 10-puff capacitor. The question then becomes, how much charge is there initially? Well, do you remember the definition of a capacitor? Capacitance is charge per volt. Okay, so I can actually use this and I can figure out the initial charge. So my capacitance was 10 puff, okay, and my Q init is my variable I'm solving for, and the voltage was 3.3. So this ends up being Q init is equal to that times that, which is, does anybody know? 3.3 times 10, so it's 30, what, 33 pico coulombs, okay? All right, cool. So I got my coulombs. Now what happens is this. You close the transistor. This now moves into a new situation where what you have is you have this. You have a capacitor and a capacitor. This is going to be 10 picofarads over here. This is going to be 150 picofarads here. And this are now connected. Now remember, 
this did not have any charge on it. This was totally at zero. So what we look at now is if I have two capacitors that are in parallel and I have 33 picocoulombs across them, what is the voltage? So you have to recognize something. How do capacitors in parallel combine? They add together. So this then becomes 160. This is the equivalent of having 160 picofarad capacitor, because they're connected in parallel. And this has 300 or 33 picocoulombs of charge. And what I want to know is, what's the final voltage? So how do I solve for that final voltage? Well, you go back to capacitance is equal to charge per volt. And this time, we know the capacitance. It's 160 puff. And we know the charge, which the charge is conservation of charge, so it's 33 picocoulombs. And that's over the voltage, which we call final. And that's what we're solving for. And if you flippity-dippity and do the division, what happens is that V final equals, let me look it up here, 1.75 volts. Here's, that's what's fascinating about this. These are accurate numbers. Okay? So these are representative numbers. And the problem is that the 1 is actually not even close to the power supply. So it's not even close to what you started with. The good thing about it, though, is that it is slightly above half of the power supply. Notice that half of the power supply would be 1.65. And this is a little bit above it, charge sharing. Okay. All right. Beautiful. The thing about it that, that, is, that you need to do, though, is that now you have these tiny little voltages. You no longer have full 3.3 and full zeros. What you have is these little voltages that are right in the middle. They're just a little bit above VCC over 2, a little bit below. And then you have to start bringing in analog amplifiers in order to boost them back up. So you have this concept of what's called a sense amp in a DRAM. Okay? So those are basically the concepts that you have when you got a DRAM. So DRAM, dense because you have a 1T configuration and they can make capacitors very small, but slow because you have to do so much stuff to access the cell. You have to charge pump to get the, the word lines up to a high voltage, look at them, you have to, you have to refresh, you have to do all this sort of stuff.